So it's my great pleasure um, to begin this next session. I'm Rebecca Schneider. I'm uh, in the Theater, Arts, and Performance Studies Department. And our afternoon session um, will begin with Timothy Buse, who's in the English Department here at Brown. Um, his uh, concept is free indirect. And then we'll move to Amanda Anderson, who is also in the English Department. And she will be discussing character. You have 30 minutes each, right? And then we'll do the, the same as we've been doing, so great. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Free indirect is familiar to us as a term in narrative theory. Can everybody hear me okay? Sort of. Project? Um, is a, a free indirect is, a, is familiar as a term in narrative theory where it denotes a mode of reporting the speech or thoughts of a fictional character in the third person without using direct quotation. Contrary to what is often supposed, free indirect discourse is not in itself a technique of ambiguity. When Virginia Woolf represents the thoughts of Clarissa Dalloway in the opening of her 1925 novel, Mrs. Dalloway, the words go, Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself, for Lucy had her work cut out for her. The doors would be taken off their hinges. Rumpelmayer's men were coming. There is no doubt about the identity of the focalization, uh, which is the very awkward term coined by uh, Gerard Jeannette to denote the point of view of a passage of free indirect discourse. Nevertheless, free indirect discourse has provoked a rich body of reflection by narratologists and literary critics due to its supposed ability to give us the point of view of a character, even while retaining in some sense the perspective of the observer. D.A. Miller describes free indirect style as a radically cloven practice, a mode of broaching, quote, an impossible identification, unquote, and suggests that it emanates as much from the, from the narrator's persistence in detachment from character as from a desire to merge with it. The separation between narrator and character is thus the condition for the exquisite paradoxes celebrated in Miller's analysis of free indirect style. Narration, he says, comes as near to a character's psychic and linguistic reality as it can get without collapsing into it. Uh, the character does as much of the work of narration as she may without acquiring its authority. These formulae uh, do nothing to dislodge the, the character from its place in the field of vision of the author. Coexisting with this sense of a combination of or, or a tension between perspectives is an al almost utopian tendency that celebrates in free indirect discourse something closer to the abandoning of perspective. We can draw a visual analogy with the development of uh, the, the Russian painting avant-garde through the 1910s from the fragmentation of point of view in a work like Malevich's Woman at the Tram Stop, stop which is in fact uh, displayed here from 1913 to 1914, to the complete obliteration of perspective in works of so-called abstraction, such as dynamic suprematism of 1915 to 1916, or black square of 1915. When Mikhail Bakhtin, writing about the element of address in the works of Dostoevsky, says that there is nothing merely thing-like, no mere matter, no object. There are only subjects. He's, only, he's not talking about the complexity or the proliferation of points of view, but about the disappearance of perspective from Dostoevsky's narratives. At least that's my claim. Narration in Dostoevsky, he says, is always narration without perspective. And I'll illustrate this point uh, briefly, not with a passage from Dostoevsky, but with a, a couple of tiny fragments from James Kelman's 1984 novel, How Late It Was, How Late, the entirety of which is written in free indirect discourse. First example, whenever Sammy walked it into town, it, the, the whole novel is, 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 t is written in free indirect perspective, free and direct discourse from the perspective of, it, of its Scot sort of Scottish protagonist. And it's, the whole novel is told in a kind of Glaswegian um, dialect, which I won't attempt to uh, reproduce. Sammy, <laughs> Sammy glanced at his, ri uh, sorry, um, when, whenever Sammy walked into town, which was usually always, then he took the road to the bridge. That's the first example. And the second, Sammy glanced at his, at his wrist, but had fuckle watch on, meaning no watch on. In such passages, 
the point of view of the narrator is one of immediate proximity to the hero, as Bakhtin said of Dostoevsky. All representation is structured from a maximally close and aperspectival perspective. And this, I would suggest, is how we should read Malevich's or Olga Rosanova's non-objective compositions also, uh, as the last stage in a project to democratize point of view, a project whose endpoint is the abandonment of perspective altogether. It is for these reasons that Bakhtin, and that's the end of the, uh, I won't show any more uh, uh, visuals, but I will show a couple of quotations, uh, we'll display a couple of quotations at the end of the uh, 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 paper. It is for these reasons that Bakhtin, in a late text, conceives of free indirect discourse as existing at the frontier of the philosophy of language. Free indirect discourse, or as Bakhtin calls it, following his colleague and associate Valentin Voloshinov, quasi-direct discourse, is predicated not only on dialog dialogical relations between speakers or between utterances, but on the, on the dialog dialogism of the word itself, a quality of sociality that precedes the use of the word in a particular social context. As such, he says, free indirect discourse carries language itself beyond the boundaries of linguistics. Any relation to meaning is, is dialogic. Understanding itself is dialogic, he says, which is to say unfinalizable. Free indirect discourse enables, in Bakhtin's words, the representation of someone else's idea preserving its full capacity to signify as an idea while at the same time preserving a distance, neither confirming the idea nor merging it with the author's own expressed ideology. That reference to distance is misleading for in free and direct discourse, the distance between author and idea is infinite, or we might also say vanishes to nothing. By full capacity to signify as an idea, Bakhtin means that the idea of a fictional character is not an object of representation, nor merely a characterizing feature, nor a pre-existing idea of the author projected into a character, one that might equally be embodied in another character or another work. The idea we encounter in Dostoevsky is fully independent, fused with the person in whom it is born, whose idea it is. As such, it remains internally dialogic and therefore unfinalizable. The character, that is to say, is no longer in the field of vision of the author or the narrator. And here we touch on the real ambiguity of free and direct discourse. For in comprehending all these qualities, free and direct discourse for Bakhtin seems to be less a poetic practice than a model for understanding the true nature of language. The, the logic of free and direct operates then at two levels. The first is intersubjective or interdiscursive, the level of the third person reporting of speech or thought. And we might call this level uh, rhetorical since it leaves intact the boundaries of the entities that are thereby put into dialogue and presupposes the determinability of who is speaking and what is intended in that person's speech. The second level is intra-subjective or intra-discursive, that of the de facto functioning of language. And certainly free and direct in, in Bakhtin's understanding is a poetics that operates rhetorically but it is also a philosophy of language, the proposition of a dialogicality internal to language. The most celebrated work of dialogical literary criticism is Bakhtin's study of Dostoevsky, problems of Dostoevsky's poetics. But the figure who brings out the free indirect as a theory of language itself is the aforementioned uh, Valentin Voloshinov. For Voloshinov in Marxism and the Philosophy of Language from 1929, Language, in its essence, is not an abstract system of impersonal significations, but a feature of everyday life that includes many extraverbal or situational factors to do with, quote, the historical instant to which the utterance belongs, unquote. Thus, language is not merely an interaction of speaker with speaker, but of word with word. Language is made up not only of normatively identical forms, but of pre-existing utterances, anticipations of a response, and local inflections of meaning, an entire fabric of social orientation that is inseparable from the expression itself. 
Understanding, then, is, is not a task of recognizing a familiar linguistic form, but on the contrary of responding to its novelty. And the novelty it takes place always in a, in a very spe specific situation. So the understanding cannot take place from outside that situation. Language itself, then, has a free indirect quality. The meaning of an utterance is inaccessible to a purely linguistic analysis undertaken from outside the concrete context. According to Voloshinov, any attempt even to delimit the object of investigation is bound to forfeit, quote, the very essence of the thing we are studying. When free indirect discourse, in Voloshinov's words, obliterates the precise external contours of reported speech, unquote, it merely formalizes an asyntacticality that is inherent in all uh, social discourse. So the question I want to ask, having kind of outlined this notion of, uh, the fr of free and direct, free and direct discourse, is whether the notion of free and direct, and in my uh, usage, that term will be liberated from the poetic or rhetorical notion of free and direct discourse or free and direct style, whether that notion of free and direct can offer an answer to the question of the possibility of a non-regime mode of thought within art and literature. That is to say, can a concept of free indirect, a concept that would be at odds with its very conceptualization, provide the basis of an authentically political thought, the location of a, of a, of a political subjectivity? We can also state this proposition negatively from the other side. Is the revolution, as it has been called, of free and direct discourse anything more than an aesthetic revolution? Can free and direct, as a logic of perception rather than of discourse, shorn of its aesthetic qualities, which are also its qualities as a, as a poetic practice, offer something more than a poetics? These questions come to me in part via the work of Jacques Rancière and from his definition of politics in terms of dissensus. The essence of politics, we read in Rancière, is dissensus from the 10 Theses on Politics. And dissensus, quote, is not a confrontation between interests or opinions. It is the demonstration of a gap in the sensible itself, unquote. Rancière's contrast between two possible understandings of dissensus, dissensus between and dissensus within, is analogous to the two notions of free indirect that I've already talked about. On one hand, a novelistic discourse, a, a poetic practice, a technique for representing speech or thought predicated on the stability of subject positions, both within the diegesis and without. And on the other hand, a non-subjective quality that is intrinsic to language as such, a mode of reading as much as of writing, in relation to which the, the practice of free indirect discourse in a vivid image from uh, Voloshinov represent, represents nothing so much as the rupturing of a dike. In free indirect discourse, quote, authorial intonations freely stream into the reported speech, unquote. The filmmaker uh, Pier Paolo Pasolini, playing with the Italian term for point of view shot, uh, soggettiva, refers to the point of view of the camera as a soggettiva libera indiretta, a free indirect subjective. Pasolini is explicitly differenti differentiating between the forms of literature and cinema, pointing out that uh, cinema does not have the possibilities of interiorization and abstraction that the word has. That cinema, quote, lacks the entire abstract and theoretical dimension which is explicitly involved in the evocative and cognitive act of the character's monologue, unquote. But Voloshinov's theory of language suggests that those literary qualities of uh, interiorization and abstraction are not centrally part of language either, considered in its full possibilities as language. In this regard, free indirect discourse expresses the secret propensity of discourse to transcend the limitations of merely linguistic sense and enter into its fully dialogic existence. Incidentally, when Deleuze, drawing on Pasolini's essay, talks of the cinema of Wells, Godard, and Pasolini himself as putting forward a free indirect vision, a free indirect subjective, it is Bakhtin's theory of the novel that provides him with the standard of what uh, cinema is here capable of to dispense with organizational unity, to bring the distinction between subjective and objective into question, and to replace the total totalization of images with, quote, an outside which is inserted between them, unquote. Such insights for Deleuze long precede the discoveries of cinema. As a statement of the principles of politics, 
Rancière's dissensus, a gap in the sensible itself, might be seen to be part of a long tradition of radical thinking that locates the purest spirit of ideology critique in the practices of artists and writers, or at least in the paradoxes at the heart of the aesthetic, purposeless purposiveness. Lukács may be at the origin of this tradition. Etienne Baleba traces the theme of the subject of history to Lukács' theory of the proletariat as the site at which the contradictions of capitalism become visible, the site, therefore, at which objectification may and must be transformed into political subjectivity. This theme of a dissensus at the heart of the political subject is crucial to the Frankfurt School tradition as well as to the work of French thinkers as different uh, as Badiou, Lyotard, Deleuze, etc. The culmination of that trajectory, perhaps, is the position articulated by Deleuze and Guattari in uh, What is Philosophy, as uh, paraphrased, paraphrased by Rancière, art is politics. The success of a revolution, write Deleuze and Guattari, resides only in itself, precisely in the vibrations, embraces, and openings it gives to men and women at the moment of its making, and that composes in itself a monument that is always in the process of becoming." Unquote. As in Lukács' notion of imputed class consciousness, the people in Deleuze and Guattari are always missing, always to come. This notion seems inseparable from uh, Rancière's insistence that political dissensus implies the lack of a proper place for the operation of politics and the absence of any natural political subjects. And yet, Rancière's own thought differs from this, at least nominally, and I, and I want to come back to that, um, that term, nominally. For there are two kinds of dissensus for Rancière, political dissensus and aesthetic dissensus. In an essay called Literary Misunderstanding, Rancière characterizes these as two divergent paths separated by the political object operation of subjectivation. While literature, quote, dissolves the subjects of utterance in the fabric of the percepts and affects of anonymous life, unquote. The task of politics is to identify the anonymous, what Rancière calls those without part, as a, a collective, uh, an us. This distinction between literature and politics brings us up against a number of difficulties, since the mode of political subjectivation can never be consolidated in the form of, for example, a subject position defined by its defense of particular interests. For Rancière, the, the subjects of a political demonstration are by definition always precarious. A political difference, quote, is always on the shore of its own disappearance, unquote. Given the forcefulness of these statements, together with the claim that politics has no proper place nor any natural subjects, it is difficult and perhaps impossible to distinguish with any certainty between the political task of subjectivation and the literary operation of desubjectivation. What seems to differentiate art from politics in Rancière's conception is simply that aesthetic dissensus enjoys the frame of a formal designator, the words art and aesthetics, to repair the dissensus. It is as an effect of these designations then, rather than anything inherent in the activities thereby designated, that dissensus is turned into a mode of consensus. If aesthetics is a regime, born as Rancière says elsewhere, as the refusal of its name, what is there to differentiate the refusal of the name that takes place as an axiom of aesthetics from the, ref the refusal of the name that takes place as an axiom of politics, other than this event of renaming? As modes of dissensus, the only difference between aesthetics and politics seems to be the name aesthetics, or the designation regime, both of which we owe to Rancière himself. Rancière's distinction between aesthetics and politics would seem to be nothing other than a version of the naming procedure that uh, Rancière himself has called the operation of the police, and um, which he opposes to the political. And yet, if naming is the mark of the regime, who is to say when the name is uh, final and when it is penultimate? Who is to determine when Rancière himself is writing in the mode of the free and direct, that is to say in the mode of reported speech and thought, and when he is not? When Rancière renames the aesthetic regime, is this, not, is this too not a penultimate word? Is it possible that for Rancière too, art retains an unnamed and unnameable element uh, in which the work of political dissensus continues unrepaired. And yet, there, there is always an, an and yet. For the mode of the free and direct is a mode 
of the impossibility of finalization, the mode of the word delivered with, quote, a sideward glance, uh, quoting Bakhtin, the word with a loophole, uh, as he also says. It is by such means that Dostoevsky's heroes retain, quote, the possibility for altering the ultimate final meaning of their own words, unquote, in the words themselves. And it is by such means that Dostoevsky retreats to an infinite distance from his heroes, or, or, or which amounts to the same thing, approaches them to the point of an absolute proximity. Judged by its meaning alone, Bakhtin continues, the word with a loophole presents itself as an ultimate word, but in fact, it is only the penultimate word and places after itself only a conditional, not a final period. The great fascination of Rancière's work, for me at least, lies in the degree to which his own writing inhabits the free indirect mode, so flawlessly and consistently that it is almost impossible to derive a final position or point of view. Rancière too then, precisely in his refusal of the name, may be said to represent another stage in the Lukashian trajectory traced by Balibar, a late stage in which dissensus in, is inhabited by the intellectual, not only in his or her discourse, his or her syntax, but in his or her writerly subjectivity. The unity of voice that every critical commentator or theorist aspires to is for Rancière no longer possible, nor perhaps desirable. And I, I have to po apologize to Jacques now, because uh, for having really placed us in an absolutely awful, both of us in an awful situation, since any statement by Rancière himself, either to confirm or deny my reading, will, will in fact serve only to disprove it, I think. So, um, um, in discourse in the novel, Bakhtin produces the following uh, extraordinary passage, and maybe we could have the projector on. Oh, sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so, from uh, Bakhtin's essay, uh, Discourse in the Novel. Uh, even when heteroglossia, another word for dialogicality or unfinalizability, remains outside the novel, when the novelist comes forward with his own unitary and fully affirming language without any distancing, refraction, or qualifications, he knows that such language is not self-evident and is not in itself incontestable, that it is uttered in a heteroglot environment, that such a language must be championed, purified, defended, motivated. In a novel, even such unitary and direct language is polemical and apologetic. That is, it interrelates dialogically with heteroglossia. It is precisely this that defines the utterly distinctive orientation of discourse in the novel, an orientation that is contested, contestable, and contesting. For this discourse cannot forget or ignore, either through naivete or by design, the heteroglossia that surrounds it. Of course, Bakhtin is writing about the novel. The strength of the claim lies in its insistence that the novelist knows, even when everything in the work contradicts this, that manifest declarations of the novel are never unaffected by a dialogizing background. But what about when the novelist doesn't know this? Where is such knowledge located then? In the text, in discourse itself, perhaps? And why stop at the novel? For if heteroglossia can affect the discourse of the novel, even from outside the work, why not also the discourse of the historian, the sociologist, and the theorist? When, say, the political philosopher Adriana Cavarero coins the term horrorism in order to reconceptualize acts of violence without the agency that is implied in ready-made concepts such as terrorism, or when the anthropologist Tal al-Assad dismantles the point of view from which Western liberal analysts have imported prior assumptions about motivation and causality into their readings of suicide bombings, we seem to be in a world in which free indirect, the free indirect subjective, is a plausible mode in which to undertake social and political analysis, one with its own distinct claims to uh, responsibility. In an essay written in 1986, and the year is important, I'll come back to it, J.M. Kutzia 
reflects on the challenges to the writer of fiction represented by the existence of the torture chamber, a place accessible, he says, to no one save the participants. The torture chamber is thus emblematic of the limits of the novelist's imagination, but it is also at the origin of his or her calling, the urge and comp compulsion to write. In place of the scene he is forbidden to see, says Kutzir, the writer creates um, a representation of that scene. The predicament of the writer is that the limits of writing are thereby determined by the operations of a police logic, to use Rancière's term, a logic of visibility and invisibility. The problem, he says, is not to allow oneself to be impaled on the dilemma in proposed by the state, namely either to ignore its obscenities or else to produce representations of them. The true challenge is how not to play the game by the rules of the state, how to establish one's own authority, how to imagine torture and death on one's own terms, unquote. Kutzir finds an answer to this dilemma, a novelistic answer, in the character of Rosa Berger in Nadine Gordimer's 1979 novel, Berger's Daughter. Coming across a man flogging a donkey, Rosa beholds, and Kutzia quotes this passage from uh, Gordimer's novel, and I'm gonna give you the uh, passage. Uh, Rosa beholds the, 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 the infliction of pain broken away from the will, I'm sorry, that's not the quote at all, uh, anyway. Uh, Rosa beholds the, the infliction of pain broken away from the will that creates it. This is quoting Gordimer's novel. Uh, broken loose, a force existing of itself, ravishment without the ravisher, torture without the torturer, rampage, pure cruelty gone beyond the control of the humans who have spent thousands of years devising it, unquote. The passage is written, we might say, in the mode of the free, indirect subjective, a mode of perception without a transcendence, as Sartre uh, might have put it, or narration without perspective, to, to go back to Bugdeen's terms. Gordimer's rationale for adopting this mode is clear to Kutzir. Does this man, he asks, black, poor, brutalized, know how to live other than by brutality, doing unto others as has been done unto him? That is to say, the, 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 the explanation for Gordimer's use of the free and direct for Kutzir in this essay in 1986 is historical. Rosa looks forward, says Kutzir, and this is the quotation I've uh, projected, to a time when humanity will be restored across the face of society. A time, therefore, when all human acts, including the flogging of an animal, will be returned to the ambit of moral judgment. In such a society, it will once again be meaningful for the gaze of the author, the gaze of authority and authoritative judgment to be turned upon scenes of torture, when the choice is no longer limited to either looking on in horrified fascination as the blows fall or turning one's eyes away, then the novel can once again take as its province the whole of life and even the torture chamber can be accorded a place in the design. For the time being, and, and again, this is 1986, eight years before the first free elections in South Africa, the writer's gaze cannot be insulated from the regimes of perception that, for example, incessantly repair the dissensus with aesthetic effects. For example, the false, false portentousness or the questionable dark lyricism that Kutzir finds in other treatments of the torture theme, such as Alex Laguma's In the Fog of the Season's End or Ponte Corvo's film, The Battle of Algiers. Kutzir, like Rancière, refuses to offer explicit prescriptions. Responding in an interview to a question about this passage in his essay, and implicitly about its failure and that of all his work to imagine a, a political subject into being, Kutzir differentiates between two kinds of duty. Quote, a duty can be imposed on the writer by society, by the soul of society, by society and its hopes and dreams or it can be something constitutional to the writer, what one might loosely call conscience, but what I would tentatively prefer to call an imperative, a transcendental imperative. And having made that distinction, Kutzir asks, uh, 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 sorry, he adds, I would not want to favor the first definition unhesitatingly over the second, which might be regarded as a remarkably uh, evasive um, form formulation um, given that he's using it to explain the failure of a kind of direct, uh, not a free and direct, but in fact a direct uh, political engagement. Um, at which point one wants, but also I think perhaps need do nothing more than, and in fact I will do nothing more than this, uh, 
um, one, uh, add a sentence or two from the greatest theorist of the free indirect, um, Valentin Voloshinov, the thinker for whom language and thus thought beyond the understanding of the author, linguist, or recipient, even when uh, presented as an authoritative speech act, and even when undertaken internally in the intimacy of the for itself, um, the thinker, in other words, for whom language, in, despite all these conditions, takes place irreducibly in the quasi-direct mode. And the sentence from Voloshinov reads uh, as follows. Tolstoy's remarks, and, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, hoping that you will connect that to uh, Kazir's distinction between the two forms of duty, one imposed on the writer by society and the other by uh, a, a duty that is constitutional to the writer. Um, uh, Voloshinov's sentence reads, Tolstoy's remarks about there being two different kinds of thinking for oneself and for the public merely juxtapose two different conceptions of public. Tolstoy's for oneself, he continues, actually signifies only another social conception of addressee peculiar to himself. There is no such thing as thinking outside orientation towards possible expression and hence outside the social orientation of that expression and of the thinking involved. End of quote. Thank you so much. Okay, just um, don't hesitate to tell me if you can't hear properly or can everybody hear? It's good? Okay. All right, my concept is character. I'm not talking about literary character. I have things to say about that and it's relation to what I am going to talk about, but it's not uh, a distinctive part of this particular talk. Comes up once. Allow me to begin my discussion by highlighting a term other than the one I will centrally discuss this afternoon. This alternate turn might be seen as the more popular cousin of character. It's a term we hear and sometimes use across a range of theoretical contexts in left academic circles. It is a term that is often tacitly endorsed and sometimes explicitly embraced. The term I have in mind is ethos. Across the fields of literary studies and political theory, this is a term we associate in particular with the work of later Foucault, and it has been picked up by certain political theorists, notably William Connolly. It's meant to capture a form of self-cultivation, attuned to the way practices of the self help to bring forms of political life into being, or help to minimize the negative effects of certain political conditions, forces, or structures. One of the more well-known and oft-cited moments in which Foucault invokes ethos is when he distinguishes himself from Habermas in the 1984 interview, The Ethic of Care for the Self as a Practice of Freedom. There he states, quote, the problem then is not to try to dissolve power relations in the utopia of perfectly transparent communication, but to give oneself the rules of law, the techniques of management, and also the ethics, the ethos, the practice of self, which will allow the games of domination to be played with a minimum of domination. A Greek word, ethos is typically translated as character. It is a somewhat loose and capacious term in the contemporary arena, designating disposition, temperament, culture, shared beliefs. It floats between the individual and the collective without much static. And it's not a term that, prends, that tends to provoke suspicion or critique. It has some parallels in this regard with the term affect, which has a broader current appeal at present, though affect has also come in for some sharp criticisms given its more developed presence in the critical field. Interestingly, in the rhetoric, Aristotle names logos, ethos, and pathos as the key elements of speech aiming to persuade. Logos is associated with reason. And if it is fair to say that current theory is interested in moving beyond a fixation on logos, and it is of course a negative fixation, then it's worth noting that both pathos and ethos have come to the fore. Though again, I would say pathos has been the more dominant force under the guise of the term affect in recent criticism and theory. Still, 
Both ethos and pathos interestingly emphasize not only that which exceeds or resists the realm of reason, but also a certain experiential or existential aspect of life. Ethos does this more emphatically and typically as an affirmed value, since it characteristically promotes a conscious self-cultivation. Affect is often pursued more diagnostically and can dovetail with ideological critique, as in Xi'an Nai's Ugly Feelings, or in the invocation of resentment in Bill Connolly's work, or in the treatment of cruel optimism by Lauren Berlant. There has not been, I would hazard, a correspondingly energized critique of the functions of ethos, though it's certainly relevant to do so in certain cases. As I have argued elsewhere, an appeal to ethos is often used to trump other sorts of claim making, and it can do so in a somewhat mystified way. In general, I would hazard just a few claims about ethos as it functions within the current fields of literary and cultural studies and political theory. One, it is a comfortably non-explicit way of asserting an evaluative position, of suggesting moral resonance or commitment without specifying it in any way that might appear problematically normative. Two, less symptomatically, it reflects a desire to affirm evaluative practices, stances, and commitments in ways that might accompany a systemic or negative critique. If we think of Sheila Ben Habib's useful distinction between critical theory's critical diagnostic mode and its reconstructive utopian one, we can say that appeals to ethos belong to the moment of reconstruction or hopeful responsiveness to a difficult situation. It's an attempt to imagine how one might best become an ethico-political being within the existing conditions of political life. In a way, Foucault's turn from the diagnosis of modern power to the elaboration of ethos and practices of the self is itself a career internal shift from the critical diagnostic mode to the reconstructive one. This leads me directly to the third function of ethos in the contemporary theoretical terrain. Three, it shows a sort of yearning toward a conception of theory or political commitment as lived. There's something intrinsically interesting about this, at least to me. And it also lights up the extent of this impulse, even in cases where it's less easy to discern through the use of a noticeable term such as ethos. Much of my recent work has explored this deeper impulse toward imagining theory as lived, toward the enactment of various political philosophies, and in those explorations I have found myself gravitating toward a companion term, one that unlike ethos, is really in a kind of disfavor in the left academy, and that is character. Now, I should say that I tend to use both terms, but I decided for the purposes of this uh, occasion that I would try to be term more terminologically monogamous to character, so we'll see what happens, okay. All right, this disfavor of the term character stems from several reasons. It's seen as a term linked to a benighted sense of agency and identity. It is seen as psychologically naive and it is seen as simply old-fashioned, invoking a sense of virtue and vice that fails to capture sociological reality, ideological forces, and psychological conditions variously defined. On the matter of the psychological and agential naivete of the term, consider, for example, the decidedly pre-Freudian assumptions behind the following statement by John Stuart Mill in On Liberty, 1859, quote, a person whose desires and impulses are his own is said to have a character. One whose desires and impulses are not his own has no character, no more than a steam engine has a character. I'm not going to talk a lot about the question of this, let's call it the general psychological challenge to the concept of character, but I do have things to say and would be happy to address that in the Q&A. Outside of the specialized philosophical field of virtue ethics, moreover, the term is seen as complacently or bluntly moralizing, as in the use of the term character issue in political campaigns. Bill Clinton's character issue, for example. Such strategies tend to come from the right. When the left thinks someone's personality leaves something to be desired, John McCain's reactivity springs to mind, they will find other ways to describe the phenomenon. And of course, McCain himself made character a key issue in his appeal to voters. I was trained as a Victorianist, 
And for many, the term character seems to have a kind of Victorian feel. But what such an assumption fails to register is that for the Victorians, character was an invested site in the wake of the receding authority of foundational forms of religious value. The prime instance here would be George Eliot's reworking of Feuerbach in a fictional realist context, with her special attention to the force of personality in mediating belief. In The Essence of Christianity, which Eliot translated, Feuerbach stresses the psychological dimensions of religious belief, including the need for a personal God as demonstrated through the Christian incarnation. In the novels, Eliot adapts this theory to explore the ways in which other people can come to mediate this need, as in the case of charismatic religious or spiritual visionaries, or serve this need outright as exemplary moral personalities within a secular framework. And of course, there's often a skeptical dialogue and dialogic encounter between the two types, the charismatic visionary and the exemplary moral personality, with the visionary playing a tutelary role and the aspiring protagonist engaged in skeptical dialogue and testing of personal belief. Think of Daniel Deronda and Mordecai, Ramala and Savonarola. Part of what is being explored is whether life can ever fully match or embody doctrine. There are other versions of such highly valued notions of achieved character, such as Arnold's investment in an enacted impersonality, or what the historians of science Lorraine Dastin and Peter Gallison call moralized objectivity among 19th century scientific practitioners. These early versions of what we might call lived theory were highly invested in the interarticulation of method and ethos in the possibility that new methods of belief and understanding could be characterologically enacted or embedded. This was not the aesthetic version of personality that Pater would elevate and that would factor in modernism. These were achieved stances, layered and accreted and cultivated through habit and practice in the way character is typically seen to develop and strengthen. They tended to blend the idea of intellectual and moral virtue. What was striking to me in considering certain contemporary theoretical discussions in light of this history was the persistence of a characterological dimension not typically avowed. We might call it crypto-characterology. The instance that first caught my eye was the prevalence of characterological terms in both critiques and espousals of pragmatism, neo-pragmatism. The critics called people like Rorty and Fish smug and complacent, and the neo-pragmatists themselves advertised their enlightened insouciance or casual relation to contingency and anti-foundationalism, in certain cases projecting exemplary and full-fledged characters, such as the ironist or the postmodern skeptic. Are these various characterological elements merely epiphenomenal or forms of nonce description, or is there something important going on? My view, it, view is that in the particular case of neopragmatism, there's a dubious personification of theory, and consequently a too compressed understanding of how theory should or might be lived. Neopragmatism in these instances attempts to enforce the epistemological claim about the coincidence of belief and truth as a characterological imperative. You should embrace weightlessness in your being since we live in a foundationless world. This prompted the reaction that that was smug and complacent. But of course, there are multiple ways in which one might choose to live in relation to the fact of contingency, not just casually, but tragically, stoically, or with imaginative resistance. Now, I consider the characterological element of contemporary theory to be something that presents in various ways across different kinds of thinking, as I show in the way we argue now. And I believe it is centrally related to the imagination of theory and commitment as lived. For the present purposes, given the rubric of distinctly political concepts, I will focus on the ways in which ideological orientation is assumed to have a certain characterological density. The liberal and the radical and the conservative are seen to carry with them not only an orientation towards specific forms of political diagnosis and aim, but also a certain disposition or attitude or stance. For example, in much intellectual and political discourse, liberalism is associated with ideas of human perfectibility and assured progressivism, and hence with an attitude of optimism. As such, it's often contrasted with a conservative tradition that claims a monopoly on tragic, 
pessimistic or realistic conceptions of humanity, or with a radical position that locates utopian promise in an uncompromising stance dedicated to wholesale transformation of the economic and social system. What's the significance of an observation such as this, or the emphasis on the character of political thinking? Well, first of all, I would argue that it's not simply the case that cultural analysis tends to accord psychological and ethical nuance to existing political orientations as a kind of field condition, but rather that political orientations and commitments can never be understood or grasped or even made manifest in the first place, except through forms of human expression that also reflect and are routinely taken to reflect attitudes, dispositions, and existential orientations toward life. If this sounds humanistic, that's because it is. I am keenly aware that this observation might also be seen as distinctly liberal, as an emanation of the liberal temperament. But I would contend that forms of characterological and existential embodiment and commitment cross all ideological lines. Secondly, characterological assumptions can reflect important insights, but they can also involve distortions, which can be productively challenged in ways that allow for a better understanding of actually existing political commitments. My current project aims to do just this in the case of liberalism, arguing for the recognition of an importantly bleak liberal tradition that challenges certain default assumptions about liberalism's naivete, optimism, and ideological complicity. This argument depends on the centrality and importance of attitude as it helps to disclose a deeper understanding of the political thought under analysis. In this case, an historically situated, post-catastrophic form of liberalism that inhabits a dialectic of skepticism and hope that derives in part from an awareness of the many challenges facing liberal aspiration. Throughout its history, liberalism has engaged sober and even stark views of historical development, political dynamics, and human and social psychology. This is strikingly evident in post-war liberalism, but it stretches back to Mill and Tocqueville. And it's worth underscoring that the component of skepticism that the bleakness expresses is often linked to a form of systemic or historical analysis that is sociologically and politically discerning. It becomes the subtending theoretical awareness underlying more situated forms of aspiration and practice. Liberalism has its own version, that is, of pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. All in all, a focus on character can help give a richer, more historically embedded and existentially resonant understanding of various forms of political thought. This is to make a claim for an attention to character's contribution to a richer form of analysis as an aid to genealogical completeness. But I would also like to advance the view that a focus on the characterological and the existential helps to disclose important normative features of political thought and political commitment. Here's where the ethical dimension of character and ethos comes to the fore. And in order to make this point, I want to focus for a moment on some of the recent work that has been done on neoliberalism and on one feature of that work in particular, its assumptions about what we might call the moral deficit of neoliberalism and the attendant question of whether and to what extent Neoliberalism is an embedded ideology or simply a set of policy initiatives expressive of highly strategic class interests. In Foucault's influential discussion of German neoliberalism or ordo liberalism in the birth of biopolitics, neoliberalism is seen to place its emphasis on policies that promote efficiency. It is strategic and pragmatic and somewhat impersonal. While it is informed by a subtending theory, it's fundamentally oriented toward enacting and enforcing policies that will serve the market's competitive operation. In its stress on negative freedom, moreover, it lacks the disciplinary character of those forms of modern state power that are dominantly bureaucratic, social democratic, or administrative. It is thin rather than thick, less ideological than strategic, though it certainly can become embedded ideologically given the right conditions and given a period of time in which it achieves the status of common sense. But as a form of economic liberalism, it lacks the forms of positive freedom that have fueled more substantive notions of political belonging and commitment. Indeed, this has been identified as a key problem for neoliberalism since its inception. 
Interestingly, American neoliberalism, in Foucault's account, connects more fundamentally to the cultural and institutional surround, insofar as it is linked to principles and practices that informed the founding and subsequent development of the nation. In the US, as opposed to the European countries then, neoliberalism constitutes, and this is oft quoted, a whole way of thinking and being. While still contradistinguished from disciplinary forms of power, neoliberalism in the US is closer in form to the kinds of infiltrating techniques we associate with Foucault's earlier works. In a way, one could say that the distance between the account of German and American neoliberalism could be said to reflect an ongoing ambiguity about whether we can think of neoliberalism as a lived ideology. Many influential accounts of neoliberalism stress the fact that it cannot adequately supply the forms of ideological or moral support that any successfully hegemonic worldview requires. In such accounts, this form of support typically comes from elsewhere, from the moral frameworks of traditional liberalism, or from neoconservatism, or from religion. Wendy Brown underscores the fact, apparent in Foucault's analysis, that neoliberalism has a need to appropriate other more embedded belief frameworks, such as liberal democracy, in order to forward its legitimacy. This is in part because it is an emergent form of governmentality, but the problem is not only a temporal one. Neoliberalism is fundamentally amoral and strategic, however much it may wish to claim that its policies will ensure freedom. For David Harvey, Neoconservatism is one means by which, quote, the inherent instability of the neoliberal state, close quote, is steadied, insofar as it makes up for the moral deficit which contributes to its instability. Similarly, William Connolly's characterization of what he calls the, quote, evangelical neoliberal resonance machine, close quote, rests on the claim that without, quote, an embedded cultural ethos, close quote, of the sort that religion provides, systems of power cannot maintain themselves. Even though it can be hard to see how the tenets of neoconservatism or evangelicism could possibly dovetail in an ideologically coherent way with neoliberalism, the key point made in these analyses is that neoliberalism creates a kind of moral vacuum, or it fails to speak to the hearts and minds of the populace, or it actively dispossesses individuals and groups of the forms of life that provide cultural and social cohesion. In these instances, something comes in to supply the connections and affiliations that people need and desire. Ironically, while the general effect of widespread casual references to neoliberalism continues, contributes to a climate in which the entire tradition of liberalism seems suspect, Many of the more considered analyses of neoliberal theory and practice actually invoke various forms of liberalism as a counter ideal, a currently diminished or eroded political force whose historical achievements have been notable, corrective, or even exemplary. For example, Wendy Brown, who is certainly no friend of liberalism, emphasizes the fact that neoliberalism has not only borrowed traditional liberal frameworks as an ideological cloak, for its starkly economic agenda, it has collapsed what hitherto had been an exploitable space between liber liberal democratic ideals and lived realities. An even stronger endorsement of liberalism is to be found in David Harvey's brief history of neoliberalism. The story Harvey tells about the rise of neoliberalism, and it is of course echoed in many other accounts, is that it essentially undercut and destroyed the gains of the post-war period, which was characterized by the expansion of the democratic promise via the endorsement of a mixed economy, international institutions, and the welfare state. This set of achievements Harvey captures under the term embedded liberalism, thereby emphasizing its broad integration into frames of understanding linked to ongoing political orientations and practices. FDR's vision and policies are invoked in the final chapter of the book as an exemplary form of expansive liberal response to the need for social and economic justice within democratic parameters. In contrast, the neoliberal agenda is narrowly economic and geared toward the benefit of a privileged class. It lacks the moral commitment that informed the embedded liberalism of the New Deal era, according to Harvey. In some ways, then, these accounts of neoliberalism enact the forms of bleak liberal response that characterize the post-war era itself. They certainly are highly alert to the forms of power that threaten the liberal aspiration and promise 
both in its more strictly political dimensions, having to do with democratic institutions, the rule of law, and civil liberties, and its redistributive and market-correcting forms via welfare, welfare, regulatory practices, and progressive tax structures. It's also interestingly the case that the debates around neoliberalism circle back to the question of character and lived commitment that have been the focus of my discussion. In some ways, the amorality of neoliberalism derives from its status as a kind of policy orientation or theoretical position which is fundamentally instrumental, aimed to secure economic agendas and advantages. But there are also notable moral effects from this very amorality and impersonality. First, as Foucault observes and many others echo, Neoliberalism aims to constitute various agents, both individual and collective, as fundamentally entrepreneurial. In this sense, one could say it presupposes a certain type of subject as narrowly motivated as it may be. Secondly, within a neoliberal framework, moral questions are filtered through a lens which reduces them simply to errors of calculation. As Brown points out, scandals in the neoliberal order become stories of miscalculation and misjudgment, not of misdeeds and wrongs done. And thirdly, the eviscerating effects of market rationality constitute the worker and employee as replaceable and depersonalized, that's Harvey, negating his identity as someone with a layered life and character. And Harvey, Harvey explicitly makes this point using the word character. All of this is to say that the critiques of neoliberalism's deprivations and distortions presuppose the significance of a developed sense of moral commitments that are linked on the one hand to one's social and political vision, and on the other to one's sense of one's own self-actualization and guiding values. And in this sense, we can speak of the normative and not merely analytic yield of the term character. What the concept promotes apart from a more general normative approach seeking to identify the informing values of any given critique, is a focus on the quality of lived commitment, the stance adopted, the habits cultivated, the form of life espoused. Thank you. Thanks for both of those. They're really wonderful discussions. I, I have a, um, a very short question for Amanda and then a kind of blah blah question for the, for, for the, for the session uh, generally. The short question is on the category of literary character, and I understand how you're bracketing it, uh, do you have a favorite literary character who exemplifies, who exemplifies bleak liberalism, or is there a bleak liberal? So that's the short question. The, the, the longer question, I, I'd like to put on the table the, the category of the anthropomorphic, uh, knowing, also hoping that it'll bring back some of the human-animal uh, discussions that we had yesterday, uh, to an extent earlier this morning, uh, and also as a possible point of at least heuristic distinction between the 19th century and the 20th century. I mean, it, it, it seems to me that 19th century forms remain largely anthropomorphic uh, with with uh, various pitfalls, uh, and that the kinds of 20th century forms that, um, that Tim, you show in some of the, the modernist visual images uh, are deliberately non or post or anti-anthropomorphic. Uh, and the, the association of the, of the non or anti or post-anthropomorphic to the free and direct, especially your politics of the free and direct, I think are potentially really interesting. So there's a way in which uh, this, this kind of you know, rationality of form gives up certain kinds of sensual and physical um, habits of the anthropomorphic. Uh, and the question is on whose political, what, what is the political result of that kind of either a sacrifice comes to mind, I don't want to overinvest it, but certainly a kind of, a, a kind of turn. I mean, I'll again impose a, a musical example, and that is, uh, you know, coterminous with the material you're talking about is what we normally call uh, atonality, which is a terrible word, uh, but atonality is not popular, of course, has never become popular, 
as, uh, however it has been called, uh, the democratization of tones. In other words, uh, it's, it's, which is a phrase many people use uh, as a way of talking about the equalization of value of the 12 tones. However, it is definitely a regime. And one reason it is not popular is because it is definitely a regime. So you see why I bring up the example. Okay, so there is uh, one literary character who is not my favorite at all, but who is exemplifies almost perfectly the bleak liberal, and that is the uh, main character in Lionel Trilling's novel, The Middle of the Journey, John Laskell. And that novel has is sort of written in a lot of free indirect discourse, weirdly enough. The whole thing is focalized through him. He's recovering from Get ready, Scarlet Fever, um, and it's a post-war novel. I'm waiting for you to get the joke. Um, but anyway, uh, so, but that, that's not my favorite, what? He was a fellow traveler. Okay, Scarlet, Red, <laughs> Communism, okay, all right. Um, so, in any event, he's not my favorite bleak, bleak liberal uh, character or logical exhibit. I, I would give just quickly two. They're not single characters, importantly. Bleak House has a dual narration. And of course, Bleak Liberalism, the title of my book, is, is, is a something of an illusion and that there is a reading of Bleak House. However, I just would like to say that, that the dual narration in Bleak House is basically an instantiation of the dialectic of skepticism and hope, of the, of the searing sociological systemic view um, in kind of dialogue with this moral aspiration um, that is manifest in the first person narrator, Esther. So I would say that dual character. Um, and w just I'll just say, interestingly, a lot of the um, novels that are trying to, to in that I consider interestingly engaging liberal thought through aesthetic form um, do, uh, cannot do it through a single kind of character-based approach. And the, I'll just give one more quick example, which is Doris Lessing's The Golden Notebook and all the Annas. <laughs> and and um, just that there's a kind of way in which the multiple voices there are working between a kind of uh, two different kind of perspectives on that. Um, I'll let you talk. Do you want to talk about the answer? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks, thanks for the question about anthropomorphic. Um, I, um, <clears throat> Well, you said you mentioned uh, atonality in music, and and accompanied by the codicil that it's a terrible word. And I think that for the for the same reason that you don't like the word atonality, I don't like the word ab abstraction in um, visual art. And I and my the the, the 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 framing the question in terms of anthropomorphic is not one that I would I would uh, myself take up because I'm, I, I'm more concerned or interested in the question of perspective rather than the question of uh, representation. So I think that I, I find atonal, so-called atonal um, music um, fascinating for the same reason that I think those Malevich canvases are fascinating. I think that they um, render impossible uh, any stable uh, situatedness of the listener in respect to the to the work, and so um, in fact that entire experiment of uh, a, of mid-century atonal or uh, yeah mid early to mid-century atonal music is and and it, going into contemporary composition as well I I, I think is uh, very very productive. I know it's not popular, but I, I don't think that that in itself is enough to discredit it. Um, I think there are popular forms that dismantle, render impossible, uh, um, a, a stable pers uh, um, sense, a sense of situatedness. And um, many of those uh, contemporary popular forms are also mu musical. And uh, in particular, um, uh, forms that, that I think there are both compositional forms, uh, uh, conventional compositional forms, but also um, uh, the use of uh, electronics and um, and um, uh, and also most recently uh, certain experiments in computer uh, operated um, instruments, which. Um, 
uh, and the use of uh, and the engagement with kind of generic forms that I, I, that I find interesting. So this, so it, not anthropomorphic or anti-anthropomorphic. For my uh, my own, uh, the way that I would emphasize that trajectory would be one of a, of a progressive. Uh, uh, dis dismantling, or not dismantling exactly, but a, a progressive uh, um, um, volatilization of any possibility of <coughs> situating one, oneself in, 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 uh, sort of perspectively. Um. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 Yes, well, as, uh, as they have been more or less addressed, you know, in, <laughs> in, Tim's, in Tim's paper, at the, same time, at the same time, we have no time really to, well, to embrace, you know, all the problems. Uh, just you know, so just to, to one or two, few, uh, two points, you know, of comment. Uh, first, about uh, the notion of perspective, you know. I'm not, sure where, I'm not sure whether, you know, the idea of perspective, the idea, the idea of, of lack of perspective, you know, have, have the same sense, you know, in the case of Malevich, in the case, of, or we can think also of Elisitsky, okay, we can think also of this kind, effective, of this kind of forms of creation, you know, of a space which doesn't look like any space, you know, existing, you know. And I think it's quite different from the absence, you know, of, you know, the point of view of the author, you know, the point of view of the author, for instance, in, in later you know, because basically, basically, what happened? What I think in in, a, in free and direct style, uh, in literature or in direct style, I mean, more generally, you know, it's not so much for me, you know, this kind of heterogeneity, heteroglossia, dialogicity, which has so been uh, so, 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 so strongly been emphasized, you know, by, you know, by Bakhtin and after Bakhtin. I, I think that, you know, in the, in, the, in the case of literary use of uh, unprintedic language, what you have is, well, not so much, you know, the, the kind of, you know, internalization of heteroglossia and things like that, you know, as you have a kind of specific form of a specific mode of language, you know, which is produced, in fact, by, by kind of, uh, of, double, of, of double displacement, you know, meaning it is no more the voice of the author, it is no more the voice of the character, you know, if, if you think what happens, for instance, in, uh, well, because in, in French, when we think of, of uh, free and direct style, we first think uh, not of Dostoevsky, but of Flaubert, you know, and of course, what happens, what happens is, preci is precisely the creation of some kind of homogeneous fabric, you know, of, of language, you know, which in fact is, is first of all uh, in fact a grammatical matter, because of course it, it's impossible to think, you know, of, uh, uh, well, of, um, of this, you know, in Dostoevsky in grammatical matter, you know, in grammatical matter, because the Russian language doesn't, uh, doesn't allow the kind of play, you know, we, we, uh, uh, with, the, with the tense, you know, of the past, you know, as, he, uh, as is done in French, you know. But so, so I think what, what, what there is in Flaubert is this, this specific use, in fact, of a tense, you know, the imparfait, in fact, as a mode, you know, which means precisely creating this kind of thing of language, which, is, which can perfectly, effectively, think in Deleuzean terms, you know. It's really creating a new vibration, a new vibration in, the, in, a, in, a definite, in a definite language. So there is a tone precise, but, but at the same time, it's, a kind of, it's creating some kind of homogeneity, which is no more the homogeneity, you know, of, uh, well, the will, the will of the author, so, but, but it is still a form of homogeneity, but homogeneity but, uh, but, but doesn't belong, you know, never, in, 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 either to, to the author or to, a, or to the character, you know, uh, which for me also co connects with the second point, you know, uh, which is about, you know, my, my, my police operation, you know, in naming, you know, in naming, you know, <laughs> etc. Et no, and I think, you know, that, that the, 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 the question of name is, a specific is a, is a problem, okay? But uh, well, in the, this distinction that I uh, that, that I uh, uh, that I was uh, making, you know, in this article and more generally, you know, it's really you know between, in fact, two forms of dissensus, which are two forms of disidentification, you know, with a specificity, you know, that in the, in the case of the literary the, the, the disidentification. It, also, it is also a desubjectivization, you know. So, 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 ba so ba basically, I think there is a kind of, of, cross, uh, of cross point, you know, uh, where, 
uh, well, uh, well, this identification uh, can, can become, you know, politically speaking, you know, a form of subjectivization, you know, while, you know, in the literary operation, it, it is in a way going in the, opposite, in the opposite sense, you know, so arriving at a form of radical desubjectivization. <laughs> and in a way, the dissensus consists in this case in absolute desubjectivization. <laughs> Uh, thank you, thank you so, thank you so much, uh, Jacques. It's really, really helpful. Um, I, I, um, I, I think the, the, the question of um, free and direct discourse in, in um, uh, Flaubert um, is—I mean, in a sense, the question of homogeneity. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the question of, homo of a homogeneity would, could also be the question of style. Mm. And I, I think what I, what I'm interested in trying to do with, uh, and I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not working on Flaubert or, or even Dostoevsky. I mean, I, I'm really working on, con, on, on contemporary uh, um, uh, writers in English. But what I'm tr sort of trying to do is, is to interrupt the homogeneity of style in that use of free and direct discourse with something like a kind of um, heterogeneity of stylelessness. And it may be, in, in the end, uh, uh, be for me a, 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 a a question of attempting to separate a kind of more contemporary use of free and direct discourse from the kind of classical uh, uh, use in 19th century French literature and English literature particularly. So, so in fact, the, I think that the, um, the, uh, uh, the nearest equivalent of Flaubert in the English language would be Jane Austen. And this is one reason why I'm quite, I, I, I'm quite I, I, I'm a, a bit nervous about, I mean, I want to, uh, I'm a bit uns, unsatisfied with D.A. Miller's book on Jane Austen, actually, for emphasizing style there. But, um, in, in, but anyway, this, it's a very in, um, useful distinction between the, the, the homogeneous and the heterogeneous. And in terms of the uh, naming procedure as simultaneously desubjectivizing and subjectivizing, I think that's completely right. I, can, I, I, I uh, recognize that as well in, in your work and also in, um, in the, que the whole question of naming, which I think is a uh, fraught question. And I think that that formulation is very helpful. So. Okay, um, <clears throat> thank you for both of you for those papers. Um, I, have a, I have a very blunt kind of question for Amanda and um, a, a slightly more developed question, um, which um, I think tangentially hits on both, both Michael's and Jacques' uh, interventions, um, but, but from a different angle. Um, and, and what seemed, what one thing that the two papers seem to have in common to me is a, um, <clears throat> a, a notion of a destabilization of central political um, ideologies or philosophies such that um, it's the, the, the key moment for Amanda is the, um, is, or at least a, it, in terms of the logic of her paper, her presentation is, uh, the, uh, is Eliot's translation of Feuerbach, which, um, which comes to stand for the, a, a kind of a problem of a, of a dissolution of, uh, of solid religious ideologies and hence the, uh, the, the foregrounding of character as a, as a way of, of negotiating this. Um, so I, th I think you gave us, uh, so my blunt question is this, um, I, think, I think what you did was, was give us a kind of rationale uh, for liberals to um, to actually see themselves as um, and or, or or claiming that they did it, I'm not quite, they do it. I'm not quite sure, um, but to see themselves as um, as making um, uh, uh, sort of tactical policy decisions in in a way that you attribute to to uh, to neoliberalism. Um, but I'm not quite sure where the third. Um, the, uh, the, the, the third option is namely radicals, which you said, well, there's this kind of utopian, let's transform everything. So is it the case that radicals don't have character? That's my question for you, okay. Um, now for Tim, um, uh, within this relativization, I want, I want to come back to the way that you, and I, I imagine you've thought about this, um, but the, the way that you, you, you associate different media 
um, and, and this, in the case of this, uh, 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 painting, um, film, and uh, with, with, with literature in terms of thinking about the free and direct, in terms of a kind of a relativization or mobility of, of something you could, of perspective, right? Um, um, and, you know, I'll just point out when you talk about, when you talk about an author, I, I think you said at one point something like making visible the interiority of a character or something without, without completely merging into it. You know, that's all, all this stuff, when we think about visual perspective in, in light of literature and language, you know, that's a metaphor, right? Um, uh, um, and it strikes me that there, there may be good reason, you know, for Pasolini saying, you know, trying to think of a free and direct in cinema, which is stuff I've thought about, I've puzzled over a bit. Um, uh, and then saying, but of course we don't have the abstractions, cinema doesn't have the abstractions of verbal language. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, we, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go into sort of what I think Pasolini's doing, except I think it has to do with the status of the narrating camera in 60s art cinema, um, uh, which, which kind of destabilizes points of view and so forth going through it. But I, but I do want to ask about an aspect of language that I think is crucial that, uh, to, um, to verbal language that I think painting does not have, and I think cinema does not have, at least in the era that, that Pasolini's writing. Um, uh, but is fundamental to language, and the whole claim is that it's fundamental to language in Voloshinov, and that's dialogue. That's a speech situation itself, a back and forth, which is precisely what's, you know, when you look at a Malevich, you can't paint back to it. <laughs> when you look at a film, you can't, so, so, so language is completely, uh, you know, the point that language, um, verbal language, uh, is completely immersed in speech situations, speech situatedness, right? Which um, also occurs in the interior, in internal speech, um, which is another term we could talk about a little bit because it, it circulated among many thinkers in the Soviet, in the Soviet Union at the time, as you know, um, and was a very, um, was a very serious term in, in psychological research at that time with Vygotsky and so forth. Um, but at any rate, um, um, the, the dialogic is inherent, you know, I think for, for Bakhtin in the novel, which he conceives as a polyphony, um, be, but because it's verbal, you know, with it, that's a necessary, it may not be a sufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition Okay, to have the dialogic, because language exists in a back and forth with an I and a U, right? Okay, um, which is a whole structure that is not necessary to painting or to film. Okay, and so it seems to me, it seems to me that rather, you know that this, you know, one can talk about as La Pasolini about abstraction, mm -hmm. but I'd like to hear your response to sort of how one imports these notions of inner speech, you know, uh, in uh, uh, entities, especially the, abs especially painting, I think, because there's, uh, you know, how, how one imports that notion. So, you know, uh, back and forth uh, uh, into painting. Uh -huh. Okay, want to go first? Sure. Okay, um, I have a number of ways of responding to your question. Um, and I appreciate its bluntness. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm more sort of free direct discourse. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, okay. Let me clarify a little bit here what I'm doing. Um, something that I am ongoingly interested in <clears throat> is both the normative dimensions and the existential dimensions of various political philosophies, practical philosophies, theoretical commitments. So I'm, as, as I said a couple of times in the paper, one of the things that I think the category of character and ethos, both those categories, help to draw out is a deeper sense of, of, the, of lived commitments to belief. Okay, so how to kind of mediate one's relation to, let's just say, a general theoretical belief, ideological commitment, political philosophy. 
Now, of course, liberals have always been seen as overly invested in individuality. And um, for them, it is, and you know, they have this concept of the liberal temperament. And in that tradition, there's a kind of comfortable fit between uh, this notion of, of thinking through and talking about an individual relation to the cultivation of an appreciation of diversity, to tolerance, um, and, and the more um, capacious and, let's just say, edgy versions of um, democratic openness that Stephen was talking about this morning. There are lots of different versions of that in the liberal and the democratic tradition. Okay, in certain, and I don't want to overgeneralize here, but in, in, um, in certain radical traditions, there's less comfort with paying too much attention to the individual. But at the same time, it seems to me that you can always find, you, you know, typically laced throughout um, uh, different theoretical works and approaches, you can see intimations of some imagined way of, of giving that theory a kind of existential meaningfulness, either to the person who's writing it or to those who are reading about it. And let me just give an example, actually, from this morning, okay, from uh, Peter's paper, which, you know, he uh, avowed was in, let's just say, the deconstructive um, tradition, loosely speaking, and he was most interested in identifying a logic, right? Um, so, um, and, as he was pushed at the end with this question, I think from Jacques, you know, what, what must we do? <laughs> um, and I was very struck by um, what he said. He said, just let me find this. Um, he said, there is no outside. We should be aware of the logic and we should think about local strategies. But I, I'm very struck by the combination of being aware of the logic and cultivating local strategies. I don't think you said cultivate, but allow me to. So, <laughs> so it's that, it's in, that, is a bit, that is a moment where you're sort of talking about a, a, you know, how one might actually begin to relate to um, what you presented. You know that one would become that that as an as a kind of individual thinker and political agent or ethico political agent, you would you would work to be aware of that logic, you would work to understand the logic, and you would work to cultivate strategies in relation to it. That is not far f uh, for me from from what I'm interested in. Now, some people may see it as the kind of the margins of what was being talked about or what one wants to spend one time. Uh, one's time thinking and writing about. For me, it's central, and I don't think it's a, it, it, that, that liberalism has any kind of um, monopoly on it, nor should it. I just think that there's, there's a kind of um, way in which its historical embrace of a certain uh, conception of individual self-actualization has made it, for some, harder to think about in other political traditions. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Phil. Um, dialogue is um, dialogue itself. I think is um, is not a uh, straightforward term, and um, I, I've been thinking a lot about dialogue um, in Bakhtin, um in particular. And uh, I think there are two forms of dialogue in Bakhtin. One is dialogue, relative dialogue, dialogue between characters, dialogue between situations. Um, uh, and then there's something else which in very rare moments he refers to directly. Uh, and one of those formulations is, is ultimate dialogicality. And one of the places he talks about it is in Problems, and problems of Dostoevsky's poetics. Uh, in Dostoevsky we, we, we see an ultimate dialogicality, a dialogicality of the ultimate whole. And I think what, is, what he's gesturing towards there, and I think it's a gesture, um, mostly, he, he's trying to see it in Dostoevsky, he does see it at certain moments in Dostoevsky. He then continues to trace the uh, trajectory of di what he calls dialogue through the, uh, in later work on the novel, uh, such that 
um, it appears that the novel is itself a logic, um, and it seems to be from um, from you know di what uh, what Bhatti says in the discourse of the, discourse of the novel that um, that the novel is a form that, that is characterized by a progressive dialogicality. In other words, that that dialogicality seems to um, not only characterize uh, situations in novels, but it, it seems to infuse the, the the very word. I mean, every every possible word I I in a novel. And so there's so dialogue is just one of these um, deeply interesting and um, complex terms. Um, and um, uh, in other words, it's not simply a matter of talking back to a novel. I think, or, or to a, to a work of literature. I think there's a kind of um, uh, 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 there's a principle of dialogicality there, um, and my own feeling about the, about the, the the relationship between um, between painting and f between literature and these other forms, painting and and film, is that they are uh, sim in fact identically dialogic. I I, th I don't think we can talk about. Um, uh, not identically, but differently dialogical. So I don't think we can talk about Ma Malevich uh, uh, as a non-dialectical or non-sorry non-dialogical um, work. I mean, and that, that, I mean that novel, that 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 work. Let's say take you know Black Square for example. That work seems, uh, if one goes to, if one looks at all of uh, Malevich's work, and it, it was very recently very possible to do this because there's a kind of touring uh, retrospective that that shows almost the entirety of of uh, uh, Malevich's works that are you know extant, and you you see them, um, uh, you see the, the the trajectory of of Bakhtin's, uh, of Bakhtin's Malevich's. Uh, um, pr practice, and you, 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 it's very clear that you see um, through the 1910s and up to 1915, 1916, what he's getting rid of progressively is is for perspective. I mean, and by those, by the time he gets to those sub suprematist works, there is no place for the for the viewer, and it's not that there's the viewer is, is excluded; it's simply that there is no perspective in in those. Works, and I don't, but I don't think that that systematic exclusion of perspective, and then it comes in actually in later, in later works. But that systematic revolutionary exclusion of perspective in Malevich, um, I think itself is part of a dialogical evolution. Uh, 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 and I, and I, I, might, I mean, we can talk more about Pasolini and that particular essay. I find it totally fascinating, and of course, it's to do with framing and. And, and again, a very particular historical moment. Uh, it seems to me that that what he, what Pasolini and the filmmakers that he's talking about uh, in that essay are, are all struggling with perspective. In fact, in a certain sense, and they're all uh, in dialogue with each other, actually, um, uh, and with themselves. So there's a, a kind of inherent dialogicality to the to these historical processes that I I, I think is completely worth worth thinking about and. Uh, as I know you are, uh, your question comes out of that as well, so. Okay, um, so my question is for Amanda. Um, Amanda and I co-taught a class this year, and I think we're about to have the argument we didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have an argument? That's what I'm saying, okay. we didn't have it in class. We're gonna have it now. So, um, no. I, I, um, I, uh, I have a long question. It really has to do with what we, in what ways character might be a problem and or a solution. Uh, so I want to start because I know how attentive you are to uh, the modes of argumentation that we employ by pointing out, um, oh, well, I guess I want to say first that I don't think Peter said lo logic. My notes say he said that everything seems exhausted. Um, and, but I'll let Peter defend himself. He but I wrote logic. it down. Did he? You said logic. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, well, you know what? My, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't get that. So, and that was a way to record my nervousness about whether I got all of your quotes right. So, I, I, really, so I think I got you mostly right. So the, the first list that you gave us, you were talking about um, how people that you're arguing against um, use the word ethos. Um, and you, the first thing you said was, it's a comfortable, non-explicit way to be normative, right? Um, and, um, and so I just, you know, there I wanted to say that that assumes that we all secretly desire to be normative. Um, we had this argument. 
<laughs> which, yeah, which, which I, I, don't, I don't identify with that. And um, also um, that it eschews the possibility that the explicit normativity has its own comforts. Um, so I wouldn't, uh, I don't think it's fair to put the desire for comfort or even the activation of comfort all on one side. In fact, I envy sometimes uh, briefly, uh, the seeming comfort of the explicitly normative position, and wonder why I always have to make everything so hard on myself. Um, so that's that's one uh, question. Second, um, about your claim that character is currently in disfavor, which um, is a, almost like a taste claim rather than an argument claim. Um, and so, and I'm wondering. Um, you know, there's an, uh, there's an argument, which you mentioned, I mean, I know you know this, I'm just kind of trying to work through how, how we get to where we get, right? Um, so uh, there's maybe a both and here. I think that there is a certain longing for character, especially in the passages that you noted from Wendy Brown at the end, where there's almost like liberalism starts looking good. Um, and there's a kind of performance of argument, which is character laden in a way in her recent work, I would, I would say. Um, but if there is um, a concern about character, or uh, what you would see maybe from your perspective as a reluctance to turn to character, um, that, um, that it's because it comes out of an effort to take seriously the Marxian, Gramscian, Foucauldian analyses of subjectivation, um, while still, however, trying to do what can still be done after those, which is to explore the possibility of treating the self as a work of art, let's say. Okay? So, and, so that's a way to sort of, rather than an avoidance of the issue, it seems to me a way to try to negotiate the problematic. And uh, you might still not agree with it, but I would think the argument might develop slightly differently. Um, and so the question then, I think, is can we do character in a way that is ideologically attuned? In other words, that's what they, how they would see it. That's how we would see it. Um, so uh, that's that. So let me think. Okay. And then... So then I heard you say also, I feel like I, the prosecutor, but I'm just really interested in thinking with you. I don't mean this in a prosecutorial way. Um, but then I heard you say something like, because I know I didn't get this exactly right, that for, for Victorians, and I think this is so interesting, this is one of the things that I find so interesting about your work, for Victorians, character was a site of charged reply to something like disenchantment. I wrote disenchantment, yeah, that wasn't your term, fine. it was a longer phrase. Um, and, and I thought, well, okay, so what you're saying there is that, interestingly, I think that it's, it, the project there is that it's the self as a work of ethos instead of as a work of art, right? And that maybe is really where the difference comes out. So then that, that leaves me wondering, okay, so what's our reply? Can we go back to character, you know, after everything, I want to say after everything we've been through? Um, can character, even if we went back to something called character, using that name and trying to occupy that position, what could it be? Could it be what it was? Or what, you know, it wouldn't be the same thing. So, um, so, um, and so, and what's behind all these questions is, I'll just put it a little flatly, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. So, um, I think what's behind uh, the questions that I'm posing is that there's um, a real concern on the part of some of the people you're talking about, um, about adding to the unbearable burdens that are already, that can't fall under character, but that aren't necessarily what you're calling character. That's why I'm asking, like, what would, what would character mean? Um, if we think of the awful shooting in South Carolina a few days ago, there's a man who runs from the charge scene of a traffic stop. He's indebted, he's wanted, he's out on a bench warrant, he's black, he's in the hands of police. Right? And so how can character be an adequate response to that? I'm not saying that you're saying it is an adequate response. But I think the nervousness on the part of the left that you're identifying as your adversary in the argument is this is what we're up against. How can character be an adequate response to this? Like how can character be an adequate response is my question, not like it can't be. Um, and um, and some of the respondents on the more radical democratic side are see, see character as participating in the, or as an expression of an older liberal commitment to individuation as 
the site of emancipation or freedom and see it as in zero-sum relation to the kinds of action in concert that are the only possible vehicle of um, response to that kind of situation, even if they do presuppose work on the self. So I, I kind of feel like all of this is a, isn't there a both and in here? Um, and I think that's the end. And, but isn't there a both and? And finally, I wanted to ask you if you had anything to say about what the limitations of character might be. So I think you made, a, in some ways, you know, in some aspects of it, a really great case for it, which I'm finding increasingly persuasive. And at the same time, I'm struggling for the reasons I just said. So I'm wondering what you see, if you see any, are the limitations. OK, thanks. <laughs> I really miss teaching with you. <laughs> Bringing it all back. It was so fun. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, lots of things. Um, thank you. I mean, I, I think one point I want to kind of seed right off the bat uh, because I thought it, I think it's a really good point, um, which is this: I, this you're landing on the word comfortable, and this idea that somehow you know, just mild or not so mild pathologization of, of an, evasive, an, an evasive use of ethos. Not all uses of ethos are evasive in the way that I was saying. So um, I wasn't making a blanket statement there. And that's a bit of a fossil from, you know, my cranky feelings about the, the way ethos was deployed in the reception of the so-called uh, Foucault-Habermas debate. But anyway, um, so, but I do think it, it functions that way in certain cases, and I think it's worth being alert to that, which is to say as a kind of evasion of, um, of more clarity about the evaluative or norm, normative commitments of the argument. Um, but I agree with you that there, you know, nobody has um, any kind of a lock on, um, on uh, what, what, you know, uh, false comfort. Okay, um, <laughs> all right. But let me get to your kind of, some of your last points first. And also I don't wanna go on and on because I know there's probably others who would like to speak. Um, the first thing I wanna say is I'm not saying character's the answer to everything. That is so not what I'm saying. I mean, you know, like uh, that would just be so weird. Um, and I'm certainly not, and you know, one of the things I'm really, you know, the, and everything was quite compressed here, but one of the things I'm saying when I very quickly sketch out this notion of bleak liberalism is to say that you, ha you have in concert with one another, you know, a robust systemic critique right. and, you know, a, a situated both forms of self-actualization and, and, and collective practice. I, you know, I, that wasn't fully adumbrated, but um, it, there's, an, there's no way in which the only forms of response have to do with, you know, being a character or working on your character or, you know, at all. The, the, it's, what I'm most interested in is, and, you know, in this way, I think uh, there's a, a slight um, distortion caused by the whole sort of, like, over-focus on the, co the concept uh, for the day. <laughs> but um, what I'm most interested in is really fleshing out the character of the theory, the character of the political um, vision, the way in which it imagines itself as lived, which would include forms of response to political situations that are not about, like, what kind of person am I, but rather what, you know, what should we do and how should we do it? So I, that, that I just want to clarify. I mean, and in that sense, character is standing in sort of for, for a, a broader sense of what are the ideological and normative commitments in, in a way that could be um, distorting. Um, and what's, yeah, the, that stuff about the self as a work of art and, and you know, the genuine, uh, um, the genuine, I'll say principled, I know you hate that word, um, the genuine principled refusal of a certain ways of conceiving things, um, you know, wanting not to, as you say, go back. I don't want to go back. I'm just saying I think that, I certainly don't want to go back to a Victorian conception of a character. I'm just trying to show a genealogy there and say this is the beginnings of a way of thinking about how we mediate our beliefs and how we think about our own relation to our beliefs and cultivate a sense of self that seems to be in tandem with them. Um, so uh, what's wrong with character? 
um, the things I said, you know, I mean, the, 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 the possible, um, the easy misunderstandings having to do with its history, right? I mean, you know, so that one needs to do a lot of work of caveat and, and um, you know, uh, kind of walk through the things that you're not doing and you're not, not meaning to say, and sometimes going back to a term in that sense is, is fraught, but I mean it to be provocative and, you know, um, to, to push on certain things. And I do think this question, which I didn't get to, but only very uh, briefly invoked, of the question of the, psych the psychological versus the moral in the understanding of character. And I'll just briefly say that I think that, you know, one of the most interesting sites of kind of uh, contemporary thought has to do with trying to work through the challenges that certain um, psychological, and I mean both, you know, psychoanalytic, but also really interesting work in social psychology in the last several decades, poses to traditional forms of moral understanding. I, and, you know, and there too, you're seeing a really interesting version of, of the be aware of the logic, which is, you know, it's uh, thinking fast and slow, for example, the whole point is, I mean, you know, whenever Kahneman, Daniel Kahneman starts to become uh, turn towards what are the implications of knowing that the fast system is constantly undermining what we thought of as our self, our deliberative moral self, you know, he sort of turns to like, well, be aware of it. The more aware of it you are, the more you'll be able to maybe put it in check. And so there's a very interesting move there to kind of invoke a, a, a more kind of uh, familiar moral framework to, to address that challenge. I think that's a super interesting kind of terrain. Um, so, and that's a limitation you know, where, that you could confront and work through. Thank you. I thought we had a lot of that fight before, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, we have no time left, but I, unless Adi says no, we can yeah, take we can, you around and we hear the questions. We can hear the questions. Okay, so we're going to just make your question as short as you can, um, being cognizant of the fact that we really are, have very little time. Elizabeth? Talk too much. Oh. After that, we'll be with Peter so you can get through mic. Thank you. Um, this is for Amanda. Thank you both for, for your great papers. Um, okay, I totally share your interest in lived politics. The difference between us is that I worry much more, rather than worrying about lived commitment, I worry about the lived unconscious. I worry about this all the time. And it seems to me that um, if one does the psychoanalytic, one looks at the psychoanalytic use of the word character. It's just a totally different thing. It's, it's a kind of a, what, an accumulation of, of, of psychic formations, which are most of which are unconscious. I, you said you had some thoughts about it. I just wondered if, if this is not your, your concept, but you did mention that you had some thoughts about the psychoanalytic notion of character. I just thought I would ask. Yes. I guess my, my question is not really a question and it's much too general, but I will still try to <laughs> very quickly formulate it. Uh, I was struck listening to both your, uh, your papers. Um, I, I kept wondering, there, there is a relationship between uh, the question of free indirect, uh, which um, relies upon uh, distinctions between persons, you know, the uh, persona, and uh, the question of character. Uh, so I checked, I don't know why, uh, I had the, the OED uh, here at hand. And so I see the, the first definition of, of, at, for the word person, a role taken by a person, a role or character assumed in real life. And then I, 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 I begin to wonder, um, there, there would be, so it's interesting to see maybe how the history of these two words um, at a certain point, they, they seem to converge and, and to, to diverge. You know? So a person, if a person is a, a mask, um, as, as Hobbes says, for example, in, in Leviathan, which, where it is a crucial category, uh, the person, the persona, as a mask, as a, as a representation, so it's a crucial political category. Uh, and in, in this sense, it is opposed almost to a certain sense of character as being true to oneself, etc. Uh, is that, is that me? Yes, yes, it's okay. 
Uh, my question is for Tim. And Tim, I was, um, you know, I was really interested in your discussion of the free indirect subjects and subjectivation. Um, and I was also very interested in your use of the term responsibility in relation to them. And I thought you said something like there is a mode of responsibility appropriate to free indirect subjects. And given the uh, indeterminacy, uh, multiplicity, instability of the free indirect subject, I wondered, could there actually be uh, a mode of responsibility for such subjects or in order to hold and be held responsible, don't we need, if not something like Amanda's character, at least some of the elements of it, uh, di persisting dispositions and uh, determinant attitudes of sufficient degree that people can attribute attitudes to others and to themselves? Some of what I wanted to ask was already uh, was already asked, so I would let, just limit myself to a very quick uh, question to, to Amanda. Uh, is your uh, talk about character prescriptive or descriptive? Is it prescriptive or descriptive? Are we called to construct characters, or are we called to describe and learn character? And if we are called to learn or to study characters, where should we look? Yeah, actually, my, my question is very similar, and it's, uh, Amanda, it's coming back to something that you invoked after Stephen and uh, Michael's session this morning, which was the distinction between the first, or the reading panel, and then the second panel, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, that, I don't, I can't remember how you described it as a, um, a, a, a political program, or, a, you know, sort of political theory that they were working out, and so I'm, I'm wondering where you would put yourself here, because, uh, I mean, I think in that sense it's very similar. Uh, are you doing a reading of character? I mean, at one point you talk about the dubious personification of theory, and I thought, oh, this is where you're going, right? that this is something that you want to actually get rid of, and then, then you, but you don't, uh, it seems to me. And so I guess what I'm asking, are you reading or are you uh, making claims about political programs? And can one make the distinction? Oh, also, maybe also to follow up with, you know, something that uh, Elizabeth just said, it would seem to me that when you, if you are doing a reading, then that actually allows for a kind of attuneness to maybe the more psychoanalytic or unconscious forces. Uh, I wanted to ask, I wanted to kind of take uh, the bleakness of, uh, from Amanda and, and, and direct it toward the free and direct. Um, because the more I live with free and direct as a discourse, right, um, you know, I, I, can, I find myself by turns waxing kind of poignant and hopeful about it, right, as, you know, as, as, uh, you know, as a literary term, right, or a literary technique, but also as, um, you know, I think, I think you know, with some of the potentiality that, that Tim, you're ascribing to it, right? Uh, but the, the, in a way, what, I, what I'm trying to do here, what I'm and asking whether you're, you'd be interested in doing, is to kind of uncouple the terms for a moment and then put them back together, right? The freedom that one gets from, you know, in the free and direct discourse, the freedom to, to roam, and in, in a sense, the freedom to empathize, perhaps, right, without having to, you know, a, a kind of liberation from traditional um, third-person omniscient voice, right? Um, and at the same time, you know, the indirectness, right? In other words, the trick of having achieved that freedom, right? Um, in other words, the, the, there's not that much that's free about free and direct discourse. And to me, that some, somehow beckons or calls up the illusion of politics itself or of a certain kind of political discourse that seems to be um, granting a certain measure of freedom to ideas, but in fact is doing so indirectly so that they're always tethered to something that is still opaque, that's still unforgiving, that's still illusory. Um, so because ultimately, you know, at, at the end of the day, um, free and direct discourse is still third-person omniscient, but just in an elusive way, right, you know, giving us the idea that we're somehow em empathetically inhabiting minds that we're not. Are you sure uh, in the audience there? And that, that is our collective, and so thank you very much. Thank you.